Thank you, Adrian. Uh, through the magic of who knows what, the gremlins have disappeared, and I think I can run this thing now. Anyway, good morning again. Uh, I th would like to today continue, uh, sort of an extend the topic that I talked to you about yesterday, the electric sun. And of course, we realize there are these uh, streams of current that come off the sun. As I'm sure you know by this time, uh, after hearing all the other talkers, uh, the other presenters, that uh, the, there is a stream of electrical current that comes from the sun, shown by this diagram, down through those cusps and in, the, uh, in the atmosphere, or the magnet, magnetosphere, there's sort of a, a, a lily-like or orchid-like hole here and here, and that's how we get the aurora borealis. I think we're all aware of that. But of course, the, these Birkeland currents don't only go between the sun and the earth, they go between the sun and Saturn and the sun and Uranus and Neptune. And I guess last week they were talking about the, the discovering auroras on, uh, is it Titan or Triton? There's two different moons. And one of the major moons of the solar system. But uh, there is now, and has been for quite a while, the idea that these Birkeland currents also link uh, stars together in strings. And uh, astronomers used to say, oh no, that's ridiculous. We know that stars don't form on strings. Um, but in fact, it's also probable that, uh, that the, uh, some of the galaxies are linked together by these uh, plasma filaments and form what's be begun to be called the intergalactic web. And uh, there's a, an artist's, that's nothing, not real, that's an artist's uh, conception of what these things look like. We do have photo, images, photographs of, of Birkeland currents connecting strings of stars, but uh, this is a very serious investigation now, the intergalactic web. But the question astronomers always poo-poo, that, that is do galaxies really form on strings like this? And uh, there's a, it depends on how you look at it. Sometimes you, with a certain view, oh yes, look at that string. If you look at it from a different view, you don't see any string. So it's be beginning to be pretty much agreed um, by at least some subset of astronomers that yes, indeed, galaxies do form on these they don't call them Birkeland currents yet, but that's exactly what they are. There is, has become a, uh, is becoming a, a literature on the uh, intergalactic web, and uh, so it's becoming legit amongst astronomers to, to talk about this sort of thing. I would like to make a big assumption, uh, and uh, I hope you'll go along with me because I think I can give you some supporting evidence for why that assumption is correct. And the assumption I well, would like to investigate, at least, let's put it that way, is that uh, we all know that Birkeland currents twist. They, they're, they're concentric cylinders. They twist in opposite directions, but they certainly twist. Um, if galaxies and stars are formed on Birkeland currents, and the Birkeland currents twist, then it seems reasonable that the whatever forms, let's say a galaxy on a, one of these pinches, would also rotate in this similar manner to the way the, the Birkeland current rotates. I mean, it, let's put it in the reverse. It does not seem reasonable to me that they wouldn't, or that they would rotate in the reverse direction, or some other crazy thing. So I'm making the, going to make the assumption, and see how it works out, that galaxies rotate, and the reason they rotate is because the Birkeland currents on which they form, or the Birkeland currents that form them, uh, do rotate. And these, these, this rotation is uh, similar in the galaxy as it is in the, uh, in the uh, Birkeland current that forms it. So we'll assume that the twisting motion of the Birkeland current will determine the rotational profile of the resulting galaxy and see if it works. Um, the structure of a Birkeland current, I don't want to get too mathematical here, but just 
to uh, uh, have you think about my model of, of the Birkeland Current. Uh, what I developed with the help of uh, Dr. Michael Claridge and uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Dunning Davies, who's here, uh, is I developed a set of a pair of equations that determine the, the component vectors of, of the Birkeland current magnetic field and also the current density. Now, the, the thing we have to realize, and without, I'm asking you to realize it without proof, that, it's, that the Birkeland current has a, a magnetic field and a current density at every single point in it, and they're parallel. That's why it's called a force-free a force-free current. In any event, if we know at point P that we have a resulting, and I'll, this diagram is labeled in B, which is the magnetic field, but if you want to change it in your mind's eye, that the, change those Bs to Js, that's, that's fine. That the current uh, density is similar, similarly formed as the, as the magnetic field is. And what we ended up developing was an, an expression for the BZ, which is the component of the field and the current density in, that goes along the axis of the Birkeland current. And we have a, an, an expression that tells us to tells us what this B theta, the wraparound component is. And at every point P, we can add up this component plus this component as a vector sum and get the total current density or magnetic field. I will spare you the horror of going through the mathematics to uh, find that, but uh, let, me, let it just suffice to say that uh, the vector sum is that the total B. And the strength of the two components of the current density as a function of radial distance out from the center of the cylindrical flow is this. And you say, whoop, what's that? Well, that's a graph, a plot of that's this horizontal distance is not time and it's not distance down the, the Birkeland current. This horizontal axis is distance out from the center of the Birkeland current. So as you come out from the center of the Birkeland current, the black curve there tells you the strength of the component of the current density, the magnetic field, that is paralleling, that is going in the same direction as the Z axis of the, of the uh, Birkeland current. The red curve is the strength, the magnitude of the wraparound current. So if you think for a second what happens right at the beginning here, at, at the vertical axis where radius is zero, you're right on the axis, the magnetic field and the current density is at a maximum right down the middle of this thing the wraparound field is zero. So what you've got is a break. You're looking at that lead in the pencil, okay? As you come out from that center, the component down the stream begins to reduce. That's the black curve decreasing. The red curve, the wraparound, increases. And the farther you come out from the center, the more wraparound you get and the less strong the downstream is until finally you get out to a point like here where there is no current flowing downstream. It's stopped, it's zero. At that point, it's almost true, it's always true for further uh, uh, nodes of this, but it's almost true that the wraparound current is at a, ma a maximum when the Z field, the, the, the Z directed field is zero. Well, if you find the sum of those two, the vector sum, that's given by the, the green curve. And so what you see is that the, we can conclude that the, the total strength of the current density at any point in the Birkeland current decreases 
with radius as you come farther out, it drops off, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker the farther out from the center of this thing that you go as this, uh, this green curve does. Well, it turns out that, um, let's see, the vector sum is, here. yes, okay. The, this is the punchline. The uh, strength varies inversely as the square root of r. What are you saying? Well, forget all the fancy curves. It means as, as radius increases, if you, if you go four times where you were before, the strength of that current or magnetic field, if you go four times out, uh, the strength drops to a half. So it's the square root of that distance. If you go out 16, it looks like one quarter of the strength. Now that's a very, what should I say, gradual uh, slough off. But I think we keep that in your mind. That's, that's, we can forget the Bessel functions and all the rest of the contribution. But what the main point that I'd like to make this morning with you folks is that, and by the way, the, the, the blue curve there is um, the, uh, that, that is the actual uh, strength of the B and J. The green curve is, I just plotted one over the square root of R, so you can see that, except for a few little errors in here at the beginning of this, when you get out here to the, uh, a reasonable distance, the, the strength is ex almost exactly one over the square root of R. Okay, well, that means that what the result looks like is this uh, diagram here in the lower left. Uh, the, if, if you come out to a certain point like the, where the place where the downstream uh, component goes to zero, you get these green loops. So it's just, it's just wraps around. There is no component down. And you see this diagram all over the place. Uh, I think it was first uh, done by uh, Hannes Alfian. Uh, I've, I, Tony Peratt used it. Uh, several people used it. Even though they didn't have the results of my model, how they got it, I'm not sure. But anyway, this is quite correct. The, the typical plot of a Birkeland current has been used many times, and that's, that's fine. Except the trouble is that they only plotted it, this, this diagram results, up until that first zero of the downstream component. But the, but the Birkeland, uh, the, excuse me, the, the vessel functions extend beyond that. And if you think about what happens if you go beyond the radius distance where this wraparound occurs, the downstream current density begins to go the other way. So instead of getting uh, something that wraps around this way and going down that way, and it just sits here and wraps around, and then it begins to come back the other way. So there's a, a continual wrapping of this, and I tried to, <laughs> I could, that's confusing as all get out, I'm afraid, but uh, I'm trying to get the idea across that this blue one is about the last one that's just, just moving down. But then if you go out a little farther, it just moves back the other way. That's the purple curve there. And then if you go out even farther than that, it begins to really move back against you. So the total bottom line of this is that what we end up with is something that looks like an old Roman fasc, fascist. You take the tubes and put them together and wrap them with leather and the only thing is, I guess the Romans only wrapped it one, in one direction. Um, the Birkeland current, you wrap it in this direction, then you come back and wrap it in that direction, then you come back and wrap it. In this. So it's, a, it's wrapped every single possible way you can wrap it. So the, the upshot of this is that there is this total wrapping of the Birkeland current of the, with the current density and the magnetic field. And it, gets, it can get to a point where the magnetic wrapping 
squeezes the the Birkeman current just a little, and if you do squeeze it, then it re you reduce the area, and so the current density goes up. The current stays the same, but you're reducing the area, so you're increasing the current density. And when that happens, it's a runaway effect, and the thing really squeezes down. And so that's where the Z-pinch comes from. And so what you can end up with is this sort of a formation of if the Birkeland current is big enough, you get a galaxy. If it's a smaller one, you maybe get a star. If it's smaller yet, maybe you don't get hardly anything. So it depends on the, on the size of the Birkeland current as to what the result really is. Uh, so, fine. What about this stellar velocity problem? What does this got to do with anything? Well, it turns out that in 1932, uh, I think it was Robert mentioned Fritz Zwicky. Uh, Zwicky was, and with another fellow, and I, whose name I can't remember, if somebody tells me who the other fellow was who discovered this problem with, along with Fritz Zwicky, uh, the, 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 he d was able to measure as a function of the radial distance out from the center of a, of a galaxy of what the velocity of the stars going around was. And what he measured, what Zwicky got, was this curve here. And it, 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 you can see it never decreases. It always, the stars are always going faster and faster and faster the farther you go out at, at a different rate. At, near the center, the, the increase in velocity is quite, quite strong. But then farther, as you get really out to the periphery of the galaxy, the, the stars out here are still going faster than the ones slightly inward of it, but they're not too much faster. That sounds fine, except when you put Newton's laws to work on it, you realize that the, the standard is you're supposed to, supposed to see something that decreases. And so something was wrong. And along about, I think it was in the 60s, there was a, uh, a, a woman astronomer, her name was Vera Rubin, she's very famous. She had, had all sorts of personal troubles being prejudiced against because she was a gal, and the male dominant astronomers didn't like that. But anyway, she became famous because she said, there is missing matter here. If, if you uh, only include, if you increase the mass of these stars, then they'll, they'll, they'll work like this. And so the, 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 the hunt the quest for dark matter began in seriously in about the 60s. And so why didn't we get what we expect? Why did we get this? It was dark matter. Well, they've been looking for, and by the way, um, I should point out that the, uh, well, I didn't say it on this slide. This curve uh, is essentially the square root of R. That is to say, the, if you look at the radial value here, the height of this curve, the real curve that we really get, is proportional to this r, the square root of it. So if you go out here to 16, this is about 1 quarter. If you go out to uh, uh, 5, uh, sorry, uh, if you go out to 25, this is like um, not 1 quarter. It's the square root of r, not 1 over the square root of r. If this, this would be at, let me repeat, at 16, it would be up about the height of 4. At 25, it would be up about the height of 5. At 36, it would be 6. Okay, that's, that's the shape of this curve, is the square root of r. Okay, just sort of the inverse of the, uh, what the Birkeland current does. So, how do we, how do we, uh, rec reconcile those, that difference. Well, uh, in order to explain the behavior of the galactic stars, Vera Rubin said well, there's dark matter, uh, and astrophysicists have unsuccessfully sought to isolate, measure, or confirm the actual existence of dark matter since the problem was first recognized in 1932. That's 85 years. For 85 years, astronomers have been seeking dark matter. 
blood, sweat, and tears. They know it's there, but they can't find it. Well, okay. You would think maybe they'd search for an alternative. Of course, the alternative is maybe it's electrical. <laughs> no, no. It's dark matter. We'll find it. Anyway, uh, Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism have been available for all this while, but they've been ignored. And uh, the electrical properties of Birkeland currents provide an alternative hypothesis, and it seems to work OK. Let me show you how. Remember, the Birkeland current twists proportional to 1 over the square root of r. And the star's velocity profile is not 1 over the square root of r, it's the square root of r. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Well, let me bore you with just, oh, God, what's that? Well, that simply says 6 equals 2 times 3. That's all it means. So the, the J symbol is the current density. This is, this is true in almost any plasma, that the current density is equal to the charge density. How, much, how many coulombs have you got per cubic meter? times the velocity of this stuff going down the pipe. The velocity, of course, being meters per second. So dimension-wise, you can see it. It's amps per square, per square meter. How many amps per square meter are going there? The density is coulombs per cubic meter. You take a box, and you've got 70 gallons of water in it. And you move that box with a velocity of so many meters per second. Well, this meter in the numerator cancels one of those three meters in the denominator. And so what you end up with over on the right side of the equation is charge coulombs per square meter per second. Well, a coulomb per second is an ampere. If you've got, you've got one ampere going past an observation point every second, one, one coulomb going per every second, we de by definition, that's one ampere of current. So amperes per square meter is this times this. Well, we already have said, at least, I think, hope you believe me, that as far as the Birkeland's, Birkeland current is concerned, the J, that it is the total strength of the current density, goes down as 1 over the square root of R. The velocity of the stars that we're looking for, that Zwicky discovered correctly, was there, it's proportional to the square root of r, not 1 over the square root of r, the square root of r. So you solve for, well, there's what the velocity, profile velocity of the, uh, the v looks like. This is, as you go out from the center of the galaxy, you get that. So you can solve. There's only one unknown in that equation. So solve for rho. And I don't know how you do it. You see, you divide the, one of the, the square, you divide both sides by the square root of r, and you end up with, with this. Conclusion. The charge density in this Birkeland current has got to be 1 over r. Well, it doesn't have to be, but if it is 1 over r, then we we get the same velocity distribution that Fritz Zwicky measured. And if that's true, we don't need dark matter. The causation, the motivation to do this 85-year-long quest, like Don Quixote, for this stuff that doesn't exist, really, we now realize if we only are willing to accept the fact that, that um, Birkeland currents twist, and that twist is the same twist that we see in the, in the cross-section of the galaxy, then that requires that the Birkeland current have this kind of charge density. It, this goes down as 1 over r. That's not any big deal. Uh, the magnetic field around a wire goes down as 1 over r. So there's lots of places that 
in science, at least in plasmas, so that things, quantities vary as one over R. Well, okay, so here's the case where if the charge density in this Birkeland current is most strong, strongest at the center, and then tapers off as one over R, the velocity profile will be exactly what we're looking for. So, uh, okay, that's, I claim that's a pretty, I was pretty excited when I found that because that means that Vera Rubin can rest in peace and uh, we can quit looking for the, the chimera, the chimera, what do you pronounce it, the, the non-existent ghost-like stuff that we never needed in the first place. So, that's, that's the, uh, that green curve is what you get from the Birkeland current, and the blue curve is with, corrupted with a bit of noise is uh, what Fritz Suki measured. So anyway, uh, what I did was after that, I said to myself, well, if you, ha if you have the, the, the charge density, and if it's one over R, then Maxwell's equations say, okay, on. If you know what the, the rho is, you can find the E field and the voltage. In other words, look at that cross section of the Birkeland current. You can see how the E field varies with radius. It's electric force is the force per unit charge accelerating stuff outward, right? You can determine that mathematically. And if you find the E field, you can integrate that and find what the voltage looks like. You can plot the voltage. But remember that yesterday, that uh, the dam we were looking at. What does what does that shape look like in a Birkeland current? And so I said, okay, well, we'll try to do that. And uh, it turns out that the result is that the E field is a constant for all values of R. I didn't bother to plot it because what it would be is a straight line. So as a function of radius, the E field is a constant. What does that say to you in, in English? It says, no matter where you are in the Birkeland current, in the cross section of it, no matter how far away you are from the center, close to or far away from the center, close to or far away from the edge of the thing, the E field, the force on a positive charge, will be the same regardless of where you are. Okay, so there's an outward constant force on any positive charge inside that Birkeland current. If you integrate that, the, the voltage, you get the, uh, I'm sorry, if you integrate the, uh, the E field, the volts per meter with respect to meters, you end up with volts. And so volt, the voltage plot uh, in, the, in the E field uh, in the in the Birkeland current, looks like that. It's just a it's, a it's a pitch roof. So what that is saying to it, if you think about it, think about it in regard to what I said the other day about the accelerating the charges outward from the sun. Well, if this this is the ski slope. Now the one we had the other day was a kind of a thing. This one is just a constant all the way. So it's not as a Exciting a ski jump, I guess you might say, but it's kind of like skiing off your roof in Switzerland in the wintertime. So this says that if somebody starts out at zero velocity up here, this is of course the center of the Birkeland current. That the farther out you go, well, if you let yourself go, you're going to go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, until finally, well, what do you hit here? Well, you hit the, the that's the outward edge of the Birkeland current. And there is no more charge, there's no, nothing out beyond that, except some neutrals. Well, just as before, uh, if these accelerated charges coming down the chute here uh, collide with neutrals out here in the periphery, or just beyond the periphery of the, of the Birkeland current, there's collisions and there's turbulence, and that's temperature. So that says that this result says that the periphery of a Birkeland current should be hotter than the center. 
Now that says something very subtle, but in its subtlety, very exciting to me. That says, if a Birkeland current, if the structure of it feeds and forms the galaxy, or in the smaller case, feeds and forms a star, that the center of the star should be the coolest place. And the periphery out here, where the collisions happen, should be the hottest place. OK, well, that's, that's a result. That's nice. Uh, I was very happy to see that. But uh, how do we know that that's true? This is the result of a big if. If the, the galaxy and the star, the rotation thereof, is controlled by the Birkeland current, then this, sure. But so how, do you, how, do you, how much credence are you going to put in that result? Well, can we find something, some well-known property of galaxies or stars that would require this? And the answer is, you betcha. Markland convection. Now, what's Markland convection? Well, Markland is, uh, somebody talked about him, I think, the other day. I forget who it was, and I apologize. Uh, but uh, he's Swedish, I think, was, I think it was Robert, I'm not sure. Uh, the, uh, the Markland was uh, and is now a very well known astronomer, uh, ex astronomer uh, in Sweden. And uh, he came up with the idea that um, if the voltage plot in a, in, in, in a Birkeland current is linearly de decreasing, as, as we saw this was, then positive ions will be accelerated outward and create a high temperature region at the outer boundary to BC. That's what we just said. So what? Well, uh, Markland said, neutral atoms, now neutral atoms are not affected by a voltage or, or, or E field, they're neutral. They don't, they don't sense any force. So they just diffuse around the place. And so neutral atoms of all elements will diffuse into the BC, why stay out? I mean, there's no, there's no force on them, so they, they're pretty much equally diffused through there. Uh, but the elements with the highest ionization values, and that sort of counterintuitively, uh, is hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. You see, hydrogen, gee whiz, it only has one electron. It might be, must be easy to knock that out, to ionize it. No, it's tough. Iron is much easier. It's 32 or 36 or whatever. What's the valence number of iron? It's got a gazillion electrons. And it's very easy to pop one out. So it turns out that iron will be found in the cooler part, the center. And hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen will be found on the outside. So says Markland, anyway. Well, uh, I kind of like that because uh, that results in something that looks very similar to a Birkeland current. And uh, it says that elements with the lowest values of ionization will be at the center, but the hydrogen, that's the important one, will be found in the periphery. Again, so is he right? Is it true? Well. Recently, Dr. Mike Merrifield, some of you may know him, he's uh, uh, at the University of Nottingham. He discovered via a, a spectroscopic dis study, he's an excellent spectroscopist, that the outer regions of this galaxy, NGC 4550, had a strangely heavily oxygen, I'm sorry, hydrogen population of stars at its periphery. And this is a big, oh my god, to astronomers. Because why shouldn't the hydrogen stars be spread out uniformly across this disk? Why are they all pushed out to the, to the periphery? Well, Merrifield, is, he's been doing his YouTube things. And he said, well, it's because hydrogen got in there. It, 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 they must be younger, because what happened was this galaxy was formed. And then a gazillion years later, some unknown entity came along with a bunch of hydrogen and put it on the periphery. Well, it turns out that this 4550 
isn't really close to anything else. This guy is not a, not a hydrogen-rich galaxy, neither is this. That, that answer doesn't really hold water. But I think the answer is that, right, Mike, you're correct. You did excellent work in identifying where those hydrogen-rich stars were, but they're out there at the periphery because of Markland convection. Markland said the hydrogen will be found at the periphery, and this baby was formed by a Birkeland current that twisted. And also, the icing on the cake is this NGC 4550 has counter rotation, which is a wild anomaly for astronomers. How can stars be going around this way, and then a little bit farther out, they're going this way, and a little bit farther out, they're going? That's crazy. Not if you know how a Birkeland current works, because that's exactly what happens in a Birkeland current, or can, depending on whether on certain things about the, the, the current densities involved. So anyway, what I say, what I claim is that uh, the, this whole system seems consistent. I realize it's all predicated on an if, if the, the Birkeland current controls the rotation of the galaxy, then, yeah, you get exactly what you've been looking for for the last 85 years, and you're able to explain what Dr. Merrifield found on this particular galaxy, and this one is not the only one in the sky that has those properties. So, uh, I think that the rest is sort of self-explanatory. Self and uh, the uh, this, this last slide, really, I have is that uh, we all know that uh, Jupiter is fed by those by a Birkeland current, and of course that property of counter rotation uh, exists here in, in the, the North Pole of Jupiter. There is all sorts of 15 rings of counter rotating cloud belts, and. Uh, but Birkeland currents come in many sizes. This is the, fo the famous floating water bridge. We were talking about that last evening. Uh, and this is a bridge that forms and supports itself between two beakers of water. And, and one beaker is an electrode with about 300 volts positive. In the other beaker, there's a, neg a negative electrode, which is grounded. And what you find is if you put red dye in this one, you can see that this is a pinkish flow going across here, and this eventually becomes pinker and pinker and redder and redder. So that's proof that there's stuff over here that goes this way. Then without changing anything, you pour a bunch of green dye in, in this one, and the, you can see the... So this begins to change color to a combination of pink and green, and all of a sudden, this one begins to turn greener and greener and greener. So there's a, there's a counterflow. This is a Birkeland current, and it, is, it has um, symmetrical pipes, if you will, pathways inside it, some conducting in one direction, some conducting in the other direction. Everybody was... Somebody very aptly asked me the other day, yesterday, um, okay, you got these Birkeland currents that go through the sky and all that, but how do they, where's the return line? Anybody who knows anything about electricity realizes if you, if you break the circuit, it's, everything stops. How do you get the stuff to make a loop? And the answer is it goes down and it comes back inside the same con conductor. At least it's capable of doing that. And if, I presume that nobody's found the hidden ground line yet in the universe, so... I'll go along with the, the idea that the return comes back through the center of this thing. But the point on this is just that Birkeland currents come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from very small to intermediate to monstrous. And uh, with that, I'll, there's your counter-rotating cloud belts. Thank you.